So now we get to the uh, first, real first session of the conference on theory, theory of the relations between uh, religion and equality. And I will present um, the, uh, the presenters briefly. Please, you have, all of you have in the folder short bios of all the participants, so I don't have to read all of this, and you can see yourself. So I just, uh, you know, make a brief presentation of each of the uh, presenters. Mark Rosen from Chicago Kent College of Law, and uh, Mark, Mark is teaching uh, um, constitutional law, and uh, Mark uh, is published in uh, very prestigious uh, venues like uh, Harvard Law Review, Penn Law Review, California Law Review, and other uh, first class journals of law. And we are uh, privileged to have him, actually not the first time in the conference. So our pleasure again. Thank you. Okay, great. Good evening. And I'm gonna speak loudly because uh, I have to work against my jet lag and hopefully your <laughs> jet lag. I got in really late last night. All right, so um, I'm going to try to um, frame much of uh, what hopefully we'll be talking about over the, uh, over the next two days jurisprudentially. Um, and I'm going to be speaking not about religion generally, but the religious freedom versus equality. And what I'm going to do to facilitate my jurisprudential discussion um, is to jump back and forth between um, whatever, jurisprudence, relatively high level abstract analysis, and a concrete case, because I think that the concrete case will help illustrate um, the jurisprudential uh, points that I'm, uh, that I'm trying to make. Um, so uh, uh, building on something that Justice Hendel said, um, he identified uh, three areas where um, equality issues arise within the United States, I'm sorry, in Israel, in the United States, and in many other countries, as is shown by several of the uh, uh, papers uh, presented here. There's a, there's a fourth area um, that where there's a, uh, there's a lot of uh, application and uh, controversy in the application of equality, and that um, concerns um, uh, gay rights. And um, uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, deal with uh, a live example um, that's uh, coursing its way through the United States, um, which concerns what I'll call the, um, the religious florist, all right? And so in the United States, uh, many states permit same-sex marriage, and the United States Supreme Court is likely going to declare that um, uh, a requirement of the U.S. Constitution nationwide shortly. Um, and um, there's um, this following question. Um, if there are um, religious florists and wedding planners and photographers um, who would not like to participate in a same-sex uh, ceremony, uh, can they? And this is an instance where um, there's um, a real conflict that uh, can arise between equality and uh, religion um, because we can see how uh, I think uh, a religious florist might not want to participate um, in, um, uh, in a same-sex ceremony, um, but there's, a, there's an equality right that can be asserted uh, by the same-sex couple because in many jurisdictions, there are anti-discrimination laws that apparently would um, uh, not allow a religious florist to uh, decide to give service to heterosexual marriages, but not to same-sex marriages. And um, I won't give you the specifics of how um, uh, the controversy is working its way out in the United States. I just want to, I want us to think about this uh, as an instance um, where there can be apparently a conflict uh, between religion, uh, religious freedom, I should say, for example, the religious freedom of the religious florist and um, equality. Um, now, with that as the example that I'm going to uh, be referring to throughout uh, the, the course, uh, throughout, sorry, the course, throughout tonight's talk, <laughs> I don't have that long with you. Um, um, what I want to do um, is show you two different ways, perhaps three different ways, that um, we can think about um, the relationship between religious freedom and equality. And, um, 
And I want to suggest that um, these are meaningfully different ways. I want to work with you some of the implications of um, thinking about the relationship between religious freedom and equality in these ways. So one way um, is a way that I'll just call pluralism. I'll associate it with, uh, with Isaiah Berlin. The idea that uh, religious freedom is a commitment um, equality is a commitment. This is why the way I, the way I think about rights, their commitments, their prima facie commitments, we don't know how they're going to work out in concrete cases over time, but they're strong commitments that we have. But they're distinct commitments that in particular cases can conflict, can, can generate conflicts. This is one way of understanding the relationship between two rights like religious freedom and equality. Um, there's at least um, one important contender, um, maybe two. Um, one important contender is what I'll call monism, which is the idea that there's, there's some really single right out there or single source of concern like dignity or autonomy or self-determination um, that generates um, derivative rights like religious freedom and like equality. And um, this is a position, for example, that has been advanced by uh, Dworkin, Ronald Dworkin, um, and it's been advanced also by Jeremy Waldron. And um, it has a, a fair amount of purchase um, for many people. Um, there's, again, I'm, I'm just showing you these three approaches and I'm gonna wa work through an analysis um, with, them, with you uh, in a few minutes. A third approach, which I actually think is a, a subset of this approach, but maybe we'll break it out separately, um, is to think, well, um, there really isn't a religious freedom and equality, but there's really only one right there, and to assimilate one of those rights to the other. And many of the papers in uh, the conference have identified what I think is, a, is, a, is something of a trend, which is um, for there to be substantial assimilation of religious freedom into equality. All right, and just to, to think about religious freedom as a specific example um, or um, instantiation of equality. Um, in this case, this what well, you might call this an assimilationist approach. Um, this is uh, you know sort of I think it's a hard moment and where essentially equality is uh, you know is the is the source um, commitment. Okay, so these are three different ways of understanding the relationship um, between. Um, uh, between these, uh, between these commitments, or between, um, or between these rights. Now, why is it, um, why is it in, in, important to understand that these are three ways, or these are three strategies actually that that, that people take um, to uh, analyzing um, problems in society? Well, um, the uh, let's focus our attention first on on two. Um, the um, the attraction of two, of uh, trying to say that well, in fact. Um, religious freedom and equality are really just derivative of an antecedent value like dignity, is that um, if we properly understand dignity, um, we'll understand the appropriate scope of religious freedom and the appropriate scope of equality. And hard monist approaches tend to go like this. If you properly understand each of these derivatives because you properly understand the source, guess what, there won't be conflict between religious freedom and equality. Um, and this strategy, um, the assimilation of religious freedom into equality, which has happened substantially within the United States actually, um, promises the same thing, um, which is to say that um, there really won't be conflict between equality and free and religious freedom. Um, and um, so these two approaches hold out the possibility that once you properly understand equality or properly understand dignity, conflict goes away. And that can appear to be a, a very good thing because a lot of people don't like conflict. They like to avoid conflict. Um, so this approach, the first approach, which I'm going to sort of provisionally um, champion tonight, is an approach that acknowledges that um, conflicts are inevitable, and then I'll discuss with you, that has certain strategies for dealing with conflict. But one of the main things I want you to understand that flows from understanding these different relationships between religious freedom and equality um, is uh, it has implications vis-a-vis um, -vis conflict, whether there are conflicts at all. 
Now, <clears throat> now I, I'm telling you that I'm provisionally uh, defending this. Why would I like conflicts? It's not so much that I like conflicts, although I actually think the conflicts have some very surprising benefits, but it's just I'm not at the end of the day convinced that um, this strategy of hard monism works. Um, and uh, I'm not convinced that there's any single source commitment like dignity or self-determination that um, really is the source of uh, these, uh, these commitments. And I'm going to suggest to you that um, there's dangers um, if, you know, in trying to find a single source. The main danger is this. Um, it's a danger of reductivism. All right? If you think, for example, that dignity is the master source um, from which religious freedom and equality derive such that, you know, if you want to police apparent conflicts between these two, all you have to do is think back to dignity and figure out what dignity implies. Well, that will work for you only if religious freedom and equality are full translations of, uh, sorry, I, um, I just misspoke. Only if dignity fully captures and fully translates all the values that inhere in what we think the best understanding of religious freedom and equality is, right? Because if dignity, for example, captures only part of the universe of what is important about religious freedom and dignity, then resolving conflicts by only looking at dignity is going to disregard some normatively important considerations, right? So um, there's actually a lot at stake. Um, another way of putting it is um, strong monism might get you a elimination of conflicts, but the, course, the question is whether it's worth the cost. And if it eliminates normatively significant considerations, um, then that's a problem. And uh, so the, uh, what I tried to do in my paper is, um, is try to show you um, in the specific context of um, religious freedom and, uh, uh, and equality in the religious florist context, I tried to suggest to you that the concept of dignity doesn't really do much work in resolving this conflict. Um, it doesn't do much work ultimately because there's dignitary considerations that can be said fairly, I think, to belong both to the gay couple and also to the religious couple, but also because dignity actually omits some normatively important um, considerations that are a part of religious freedom. Now let me um, illustrate for you what I think are some of the important things that are omitted um, uh, through uh, uh, trying to uh, translate um, religious freedom fully, um, uh, fully into, uh, into dignity. Um, so the, um, one of the strong reasons, it seems to me, um, for having a um, religious freedom commitment um, is uh, you can come to just through uh, political theory um, having, that does not presuppose dignity as a master concept. Um, one common liberal commitment is not to be part of a totalitarian society. And you can have a not totalitarian society only if people have, you know, the citizens have some freedom of choosing um, the important purposes and projects um, that um, they want for their life. And that sort of anti-totalitarian commitment, I'll suggest to you, is not perfectly captured by the concept of dignity. Or you have to do a lot of shoehorning um, if you want to capture anti-totalitarianism and say it's really just derivative of dignity. I think it's more natural to say that there are considerations apart from dignitary ones that give rise to the value of religious freedom. Now, similarly, look what's happening in the United States and um, according to some of the papers uh, in other jurisdictions as well. Um, the, um, what I can report to you in the United States um, is that um, Equality um, is assimilating um, religious freedom. In United States constitutional doctrine, for example, um, the, uh, the rule basically is that as long as a government 
a state or the federal government, doesn't directly target the Muslims or Jews and say, we want to get them, the government is allowed to create a, um, a rule, um, for example, a rule barring circumcision or barring uh, ritual slaughter um, that um, substantially impairs um, the uh, ability of Muslims or Jews to, uh, to practice their religion. Um, that rule, that reflects an anti-equality uh, notion, and the idea that, well, we just don't want the government to actively discriminate against one religious group. But what's left out, it seems to me, um, of uh, equality is, uh, look, what a religious person wants to do is to be able to live their life. They don't really care so much how other, I mean, they probably want other religious people to be able to live their lives too, but um, they want fundamentally to live their life. In other words, at the heart, it seems to me, of um, religious freedom um, is a liberty consideration, not just an equality consideration. And when you try to assimilate religious freedom into equality because um, religious freedom is not completely translated into equality, there's something important that's left out, that's lost, okay? So um, people who want to advance strong monist claims um, have, it seems to me, a very strong burden of proof. They have to establish um, that their master concept, be it dignity, self-determination, or equality, fully captures all the normatively relative, relevant considerations that are part of um, these other commitments. And that's, that's something that, as far as I'm concerned, Dworkin and Waldron have not been able to do, and I don't think that they'll be able to do, simply because I don't think that dignity really captures all, um, again, all the concerns elsewhere. So now, one of the things, um, I have about another six or seven minutes, which is fine, without running over. Um, one of the things that is apparently a great drawback of the pluralist approach, which says there are multiple commitments, like we have a commitment to religious freedom and we have a commitment to equality. One of the drawbacks is, well, what do you do when they conflict? And yes, that's a, that's a problem. Now, I want to... I want to say um, a few things about um, what to do about conflict. Right? So one is that um, it seems to me that um, the, uh, the European jurisprudence, the German jurisprudence developed by Robert Alexi and so forth, actually is somewhat helpful in giving us um, some guidance. Um, the proportionality analysis, the balancing analysis, it's more useful actually than um, I think American jurisprudence is, although that's not something that I'm going to be able to defend right now. But what I want to do is, uh, is intervene in the proportionality analysis and the Alexi jurisprudence and, um, uh, and disagree um, a little bit, um, and specifically this is what I mean. The, um, uh, the important thing about proportionality is that it reflects pluralism. It reflects the, an understanding that there can be conflicts between rights and it says, well, so what we do is we try to determine, essentially, the degree of impairment of each of these rights and then balance them out. And whichever is most impaired, well, you know, so that'll be, that'll be protected. So um, I guess I, I want to tell you what I think is uh, really insightful and right about Alexi's approach and, and uh, 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 proportionality's uh, approach and what I think could be improved. So what I, I think is right um, is first that um, there's no, and here I might disagree a little bit with one thing that you say in your paper. Just one. Just one, just one. Um, uh, two things, but only one thing for now. Okay. Um, Turn in. Yeah, give me a few minutes, maybe it'll grow. Okay, no, 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 but I like your paper a lot. But here's the point, okay? I did. But anyway, this is my paper. So um, the, um, uh-oh, I just lost track. Oh, yes. Um, so... One of Alexi's points, which I think is correct, is when it comes to commitments, he uses the term values, but um, like religious freedom and equality, there's no categorical you know, hierarchy. Okay, there's no trans-substantive hierarchy. You can't say that religious freedom always prevails or that equality always prevails, but instead, it's necessarily highly factual specific, which is very interesting to hear you talk. That's the kind of work, you know, like case by case, inductive reasoning um, that Alexi applauds and that I think is, is correct. 
Um, and so the analysis is invariably going to be very context sensitive and fact specific. However, here's my, my intervention. Um, the, so Alexei uses the language of balancing, which is a language that has also been picked up um, by jurisprudence internationally. And I think that's not the best language to use. I'm going to suggest different language. The problem with balancing is it sounds very mechanical, right? It's your balance. One is going to be more than the other. It also sounds like um, whichever is more, well, that's it. That's the only thing that you get. The, the loser just drops out entirely. I'm going to suggest a different metaphor. Um, and uh, in fact, it's so newly minted that it's a metaphor that's different than the one I used in the paper. Right? The one I used in the paper, for those of you who happen to read my paper, was harmonization. But I'm going to actually use a different metaphor of orchestration. All right? Let's talk a little bit about music. All right? So um, if you have piece, you know, you can have pieces of music written out by a composer, um, and they can be harmonized by another composer. What does that mean? The second composer um, uses the precise same, you know, identical notes, but makes the following alterations. Um, we'll, um, we'll say that, oh, this note is going to be played by a violin, and this one's going to be played by a piano, or by a cello and a trumpet. Identical notes, but their character sounds extremely different. Um, similarly, if you, um, even if you just play on a piano, if you play a C and an E and you play them equally loud, that will give you one sound. If you play the C much more and the E less, that'll give you a different sound, a qualitatively different sound. Here's my analogy. Think of the rights or our commitments as, uh, as the musical notes. And really what happens when they, quote, come into conflict is we have to decide how to orchestrate these multiple notes, these multiple commitments that we have. And um, there's radically different ways of doing that. You, you can substantially alter the character of a musical piece by the way that you reorchestrate it. Um, but see, here's the thing. We, we're all working with the same sheet of music, in a sense. All liberal democracies are working with the same notes, the same rights that we genuinely have commitments to. But um, how, again, we orchestrate them um, that can vary substantially. And, um, and in the end product, um, all the notes are there, unlike in balancing. And in the end product, it's ultimately an act of subjective decision making that to switch back to what we do with these rights, when there are incommensurable values that we somehow have to put together, it's a deeply subjective act, inevitably subjective act that both reflects who we are and helps determine who we are. It's identity inform uh, informing both ways, reciprocally. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, um, and that's what I think is done when liberal democracies try to wrestle with incommensurable valuables, values that can't be accurately reduced in a hard monist way. So what does this mean? What are the upshots? Let me give you a couple upshots and then I'll end. I have two minutes. So one is that we understand that unlike the metaphor of balancing, which sounds very mechanical, um, how we orchestrate the commitments that we have is a deeply subjective process. Secondly, um, there's no reason to expect that Israel is going to orchestrate things the same way that the United States will. So I think that comparative law has its limits. When we want to identify what notes we share, that's OK. We want to understand how we harmonize or orchestrate the shared values we have. I might want to see what Germany does, but that doesn't have much bearing on what I do in the United States or you necessarily do in, uh, in Israel. Third, if you understand that the act of harmonization is a deeply subjective process that reflects the identity of the decision maker and helps constitute the identity of the decision maker because the, a decision maker faces new problems like LGBT problems, then the natural question that arises in a liberal democracy is what institutions should be involved in making those kinds of harmonization decisions. And there's no reason to think that it should only be the courts or even that judges have 
special competence in making these determinations. Now, each and every democracy has to determine for itself what are the roles of these different institutions. But the, the metaphor of harmonization um, defocuses the analysis from the judiciary. It doesn't say the judiciary doesn't play any role, but the judiciary doesn't play the only role, um, and maybe it doesn't play a very, uh, a very substantial role. Anyway, again, what I want to suggest to you is that there's really important differences between these three different jurisprudential approaches to understanding the relationship between equality and, um, uh, and religious freedom. Um, they, among other things, um, have implications, institutional implications, for each polity. And they also suggest we shouldn't necessarily suggest, uh, expect um, a single harmonization or a single orchestration of shared commitments um, across countries. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, I was debating whether we should uh, open the discussion right after the first presentation or um, postpone it to the next one. And, and after considering, I mean, while you are talking, I think in, in order to, to remain fresh on what on your presentation, we'll open like for a short uh, discussion, like uh, 20 minutes. 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll hear the second presentation, and then we'll be able even to go back and, and compare. So just since it was so sure. uh, provoking and interesting, let's open up the discussion right now. Uh, would somebody else take the cue? Would you yeah, take the cue? No problem. OK. <laughs> OK, I have a colleague in my uh, African book who published an article that apparently was very controversial at our conference in South Africa last year. And it's a, a defense of uh, of opposition to same-sex marriage from a religious authority, stand, religious self-determination standpoint. Uh, and his framework was harm. Uh, and he has a particular um, theory of the harm to religious organizations and having to recognize this marriage. I'm, I'm, I consider myself a liberal, and the harm principle is one that I kind of cherish and hold dear. Uh, and there's actually a set of concerns that is maybe outside of equality, but I'm wondering if it can be worked into equality which goes like this. I started thinking about this same-sex marriage debate and how this would play out. I mean, people putting up rainbows in their bakeries said, you know, to suggest that we, we serve all. Well, what if the law required, you know, said, okay, we've had this decision on same-sex marriage. You know, it, we understand there's conflict about forests, you know, bakers, the people who do many things to weddings. What if the law required purveyors who would serve all weddings to have a rainbow? and the others uh, to have, I don't know, a cake, a cake with a pink triangle and a slash across it. Would that be a harm? Is that permissible in a democratic society? And I would defend it, by the way, from a third party. You know, I'm just a person in society as a consumer, and I want to patronize businesses that reflect my values. So I would find it very informatively helpful to have that information. Right. Well, that's real. I'm not going to answer that question doctrinally. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, since you know this can be confessional for a moment, what, uh, what what is your question exactly? I mean, put it like this: such a politically, I would actually support that kind of uh, uh, rule. That seems actually very interesting. That might yeah, but it, that that would raise doctrinally that would raise uh, you know compelled speech questions. Right? On. But I, I don't care necessarily about uh, it's a complicated um, sort of doctrinal question that's really interesting I don't understand exactly what, what are you asking exact me exactly at least I'm sorry how well, could that fit into the inequality sure. equation and maybe is that external standpoint outside of same sex versus non same sex value is there something outside of two parties in conflict that can also weigh into questions of, of equality and, and that this external party having a Okay, so uh, let me let me uh, tell me if I'm translating your question uh, right. Are, are, you're trying to propose a strategy that would essentially um, uh, sidetrack equality costs. That's what you're saying, if I understand. All right. Here's so here's what I'll say. That's interesting. Um, my gay colleagues will say that's still that that imposes a harm on me. Just like I'm not going to allow. We would allow um, uh, shopkeepers uh, to ha to say we don't serve blacks. You know, I mean, there's a dignitary harm that they suffer, an equality harm that they suffer. Um, on the other hand, you know, maybe your your proposal, you know, um, uh, can uh, can 
drive down a little bit of uh, of the. I'm not even sure if it does. Um, it's. I think that's actually just on its. It's a very interesting kind of proposal. Um, you know, I. Be happy to read what your, uh, uh, you know, the, the publisher in your uh, uh, in your journal had to say, but I, I don't think that that would eliminate equality harms from the perspective of, uh, you know, of the same-sex couple. I mean, you hear that? I mean, it's uh, we certainly wouldn't have said the United States wouldn't have said that's all the Jim Crow shops had to do. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Um, I, I think this is really fascinating. Maybe it's some really great points in it. I just wanted to uh, uh, push on a couple of them just to maybe refine your thinking or mm -hmm. help. But I don't know. Anyway, yeah. um, on pluralism versus monism, I wondered whether you know you could still talk about a, a perpetually contested universal um, that we have a rhetorical conceptual schemes and so on, but we continually are debating with McIntyre talking about tradition as a socially embodied, continued, historically embedded, embedded argument. Um, and that still means conflict. And, and partly I, I raise that because uh, you talk about the dangers of dignity being reductivism and it can't collapse all the values into this er principle, this er concept. Um, but you seem to rely largely on um, a liberally egalitarian idea of dignity. So uh, Dawkins, for example. And you say religious liberty, you describe it as it secures freedom to pursue our own projects. And that's exactly how Dawkins describes religion as collapsing under dignity. Um, so I, I wondered whether um, they're, in fact, just if you think about dignity, that, that's a continually contested universal. Um, and then the second one I, I question I was asking, I thinking as I was listening then as well, is um, by the end of your paper it seems that you're, you've rejected an idea of an Ur principle, Ur concept, but then you, in some ways, it's, it's, it's slightly different, I think, but you bring something back in by saying what matters ultimately seems to be how we describe the politic. Um, and I think that's actually got a lot of value to it, uh, that we're extracting it to the level of political imagination. Um, but I did wonder whether, and whether and, and, and it's probably something different, uh, but whether there's a slight tension between uh, rejecting monism, at least of certain values, a uh, certain kind, maybe, and uh, coming back to in the end that we have the even perhaps more difficult task of saying what is America or what is Israel or what is you know, what is next country. Okay, um, so those are good, really good questions, um, and uh, I think that you can. I have a colleague um, who views himself as um, uh, um, he's the soft monist. Right? He's the one who says dignity, but there can be conflict between these two. Um, I'm, uh, I've been having a very uh, lengthy discussion with him, and um, I, um, uh, if you're on board with, um, with conflict and my sketch of how I think we should think about conflict, then there's not too much really to fight about. Um, uh, at the end of the day, the reason why I ultimately go with this rather than this is because um, I'm skeptical um, that I still haven't been shown um, by my colleague or by you that dignity or any other concept captures, by the way, if you want to be a real monist, captures not only religious freedom and equality, but every other strong commitment that we have. It has to fully capture in order for you to be a real monist. Um, I've not been convinced of that. Also, it seems to me, um, you know, I'm you're saying, well, this is just essentially contested and or ongoingly, perpetually uh, contested. Um, okay, um, but here's my question for you. If you really think there's a unitary value like dignity, why is it that there can be conflicts? Is it because for now we don't have a complete understanding of dignity? Is that it? Um, if you think that, then that commits you, I think, to something that looks almost like universal understandings of the scope of religious freedom and uh, equality. That, that gets you, um, you're running away from um, the, um, uh, the diversity in um, orchestrations that, um, that, you know, that I'm embracing. So we might actually, maybe at the end of the day, we really do fight quite a bit. 
Um, now, I don't actually think there's slippage at the end of the paper. To say, when I say, oh, I was, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't want, there wasn't slippage. I, I don't, uh, for me, um, when I say, who are we as Israel or the United States, um, I mean that, you know, what's our identity? How do we put these things together? I don't think by asking that question, um, I've identified sort of like a new monist uh, value. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, how we put these disparate components of us together um, is what constitutes us as a polity. That's, uh, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. But you know what? At the end of the day, um, you could be right, of course. It could be the case that um, we presently are at a point in history where we don't have a very clear conception of what dignity entails, and that at the end of the day, we really will have clear understandings. And it does seem to me, by the way, that that trajectory does describe something what's happened um, in the development of rights discourse. Um, you know, so uh, there, for example, the United States Constitution, the oldest you know, US Constitution, doesn't identify a right to privacy. Didn't its founders didn't conceptualize such a thing. But I think it's fair to say that there is something like a notion of privacy that has given birth to some of the other specified co um, constitutional rights. You know, um, the question, though, is ultimately whether that um, drama will be writ large um, to back us into a single value, and I'm skeptical of that. And also, you know, um, I don't know, I kind of, I like, at the end of the day, the um, diversity uh, that's more associated with the pluralism. Um, but I don't know, uh, maybe I'll be proven wrong. So I have to caution, I didn't read the papers. Mm -hmm. Let's collect some questions and then respond. Yes. Yeah, I want to follow up on the, the medical thing. Just want the use of minimization or the situation here. I wonder the if we're coming to the sort of actual legal conflict, where the use of the harmonization or the situation Medical can actually resolve the issue because you, if you are a judge, you have to decide one way or another in the case there. Unless, as what Justice Handel mentioned in his presentation or speech, that is, you push them out of the legal regime, say those are not the issue for the court to decide, then your uh, orchestration can work. Some have a bigger space, others will have a smaller. Yes. Um, imagine I am the florist, <clears throat> but I am not a simple florist. I am a strongly anti-communist florist. <laughs> and you enter my shop and ask me to provide the flower decoration for a communist rally. And I say no. <coughs> uh, the, my question is that uh, is uh, equality versus uh, religion the correct frame to understand the problem? Or uh, 
there is another framework uh, which is uh, liberty versus uh, state over regulation, which is a more broader framework, but uh, which is, in a way, I, I think that sometimes we are religiously obsessed and we put religion everywhere, but this is not a religious case. This is a broader, it's a liberty, my liberty against a state that wants to tell me what to do. Right. Uh, can, I, can I jump in now? Just a second. Go ahead, okay. <laughs> I found the talk very interesting, and a lot of what you said I agree with, that it shouldn't be so unidimensional. Um, and then you move, but from my point of view, you don't really resolve the problem. I'll explain to you what I mean. I'm frustrated because a lot of new issues come up in Israel. We have a, a proportionality statute, and that's what judges do. And I ask myself very often, well, they decide that A is more important than B, and some judges decide B is more important than A. What I try to do, to some extent, is to objectify, that is to say, to, to, to start talking about um, developing a hierarchy of values. But it's a problem. What do you do? You say, no, don't try and objectify it. It's subjective. Accept that. The problem I have with that is that in any system, even if it gives more rights to the um, legislature, the courts are going to have to decide. And what you're saying in the name of, I don't know, some sort of harmony or a love of music is do what you can and decide and it's fine. So, so what, is that, what does that make of law? It, 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 if it's just subjective, then you can have different results. And so seven judges will decide this, and then you know, a different judge could decide in, in the same generation, in the same time and culture. How does that help us advance in terms of the stability of law, the credibility of law, and is it really any, something that, that, that you know, should be done in that way? By the way, you have a decision of uh, Israeli Supreme Court regard exact question. I mean, yes. it was a religious group who refused to make a wedding, <coughs> same-sex marriage, a Christian religious group. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court decide that they, uh, that they should make the, the wedding for them. It's really fascinating. It's so, uh, so provoking. I would uh, suggest, first, I would talk about four models because I really think that the distinction that you are doing between the proportionality and the harmonization and the austerity yeah, is so important. So as a methodological issue, I see that the debate between these two models are important enough to be like a four models. This is a methodological issue because I have to confess that like the American model is sounds from Israeli uh, uh, perspective so childish in a way to see that there is, uh, et cetera. Now, so if I focus on these two interesting models, uh, uh, so my question about the, the, the proportionality, mm -hmm. if you are really pluralist, not a monolist, like, mm -hmm. how can could be a measure? To, no measure? But if there is no measure, how can you really build a theory of proportionality, which try to transfer from one to other. So this is a, a critique. It wasn't because on one hand you present it as a, a pluralist model, and then you say, but there is proportionality, and they try to understand if this can really exist from a philosophical point of view. And the, my second question is <coughs> regarding the fourth model, mm -hmm. the one that you present, the one that is absent in. Mm -hmm. And here the question is similar to, to judge any question, but I would like to reframe it otherwise. Not just about what judging is going to do, but let's, I agree with you, and think that this model means that like, the people have much more power than the, the judges, but still, how the people are talking to each other? How do they convince each other? It is a wonderful model for, Afterwards, for us academics to say, wow, it is so interesting, this society reflects this, and this society reflects this, but in the, in the issue when we are talking what should be, not just the, the judges, what will be the language, what will be the way in which we convince, so this is my second question, 
And my third question is whether we, I can suggest you a fifth model. That <laughs> 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 uh, can, maybe I can really frame it like this, that uh, freedom of religious will be exceptions to the general principle of equality. Let's take the example <coughs> of Judge Handel about the ultra-orthodox in Israel and the army service. Mm -hmm. So Judge Handel said, look, it is against equality. Why 18 will, one 18 years old will go to the army and the other not? But if we are looking on freedom of religious as exception to the general model of equality, then we say, in general, we have a monist value of equality. But here we, and then the difference between this framework that it is not like, okay, we have two different values and from time to time they have a conflict. But in advance, we will think on freedom of religions as a reason to deviate from egalitarian principles. To justify it, why only in this case <coughs> you deviate? Okay, so you have five minutes to respond <laughs> to all the questions <laughs> and then we have to move further for the next. Okay, um, everybody caught me on one of my feints, okay? Um, uh, this is what I mean, okay? I said, um, what I've described here um, is not a script for judges to follow, but a way for us to think about um, uh, the relationship between religious freedom and equality. And I said it had institutional implications without telling you what they are, because now you're pressing me on all that. Those are really important questions that Lynn asked, and that actually almost everybody asked. I'm going to get to you. You asked a little slightly different question, which I'm going to get to in a moment. So, yeah. but, um, uh, you, and, and Judge Handel, you're saying the same thing. What is a judge supposed to do? I don't know. It's a, a, but here's what I would want to have happen. I would want the legislatures um, to be more proactive about making these initial decisions about how these kinds of conflicts ought to be worked out um, and um, it's, it's known, for example, uh, that there's going to be this array of conflicts um, with regard to same-sex marriage. The legislature should be at the, at, the, at the forefront. And then there's interesting and important questions as to then how much judicial second-guessing should there be of the legislature's good faith assessment. And we, could, we can go back and forth about that. Um, these are very important issues of institutional design, but they're not fundamentally what I'm looking at. Um, and then you might ask, well, if the legislature doesn't and then the, the court has to act, well, that's another institutional design important question. And maybe at the end of the day, the best answer is to go with Scalia's formalism and to take, you know, I don't know. But the, the, before we get to it, questions of institutional design, let's just understand how we should think about the relationship between these rights. And that's what this paper is about, okay? Um, now, Suzanne really pushed me and I'm gonna really push back, okay? <laughs> so you're right, it is a management technique, and that's one way that you can look at these conflicts. I agree with you. But there's also a well-developed literature in philosophy that concerns incommensurable values, that understands that it's mostly the decision-making of individuals, not of polities, but understands that you know when I have to decide whether to spend an extra hour with my child or practicing a violin, ultimately those are incommensurable Commitments, there's a subjective um, decision that's behind that. Um, now, you could also say there's a, there's a conflict and we have to manage the conflict. That's true. That's true. But it's also true that how we manage it is, you know, carries all those properties that I described before, which is that it helps reflect who we are as a person or as a polity. And, um, and so I think that it's, you know, it's useful to use my metaphor, although you're right, the metaphor does have the danger of you know, making things sound too rosy. Yes, these are conflicts and these are management problems, but I think they also can be described as the kind of decision making that helps determine who we are as a polity. So, um, you know, so I'll, I'll, I stick with that, even though you're right, um, as well. Now, Silvio, you asked me a question, and then, uh, that'll, then I'm going to end, and I'm not going to answer your question, but maybe we can talk more, okay? But, Silvio, you asked me, well, maybe it's not religion, but it's liberty, 
okay? And um, yeah, and um, maybe you're right. There's certain there's a there's a an ongoing debate about that within American jurisprudence, I imagine internationally as well, you know, whether we should understand um, the, real, the freedom appropriately described to be religious freedom as opposed to um, uh, conscience um, or life's projects. Um, and, um, you know, I have a view on that. That's a, you know, um, and um, uh, in short, I mean, it's possible that, you're, that we're in a process, you know, to go back to Joel's uh, point, that we're just, over time, refining our understanding of the appropriate way to understand the right. That it's not religion, but it's conscience, and we just wrote it as religion because that was, you know, that's correct. Um, maybe that's right. Um, maybe, I tend to think that um, it's, um, it's useful to keep the category of religion discreet from um, uh, conscience generally or liberty, but we could have a, a long discussion. Ultimately, I think in, um, in answering this kind of question, what we'd have to do is have um, uh, uh, a discussion about the nature of rights. Like, what are we talking about? Are there these things out there that we're trying to identify um, uh, that's, you know, it's, there's a religion right or a conscience right, or are these just ways that human beings in modernity articulate important values, and if it's the latter, then we have to do something of a pragmatic analysis of, well, which articulation is more useful? Um, but that's a long discussion that we could, uh, that we could have, but it's, it's a good discussion, and ultimately, for purposes of this paper, I'm not wedded to the idea that freedom of religion is the right way to deal with this, um, but I'm, you know, hey. I didn't write the, uh, the call for papers. No, and it's, and it's an important way, obviously, of, of organizing ourselves presently. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.